Tony, and thank you very much to the HTAL um, uh, organization for asking me to, uh, to tell you a little bit today about, about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance, uh, just to add to the depression of 2020. And, um, and also uh, what I will do is, is at the end of the talk, I will talk a little bit about um, some initiatives that we're, we're working on at McMaster that I think are gonna be incredibly exciting and, and really game changing for how we address things like the global pandemic that we're, we're living through right now. So the title of my talk is, are we approaching the post antibiotic era? And, um, and I think it's, it's uh, fair to say that we're perilously close to a time where we're going to be uh, very challenged to, to treat all of the bacterial infections that we used to treat in the past. In fact, we're failing at that already. Um, and I'll tell you why. So what I wanna tell you about um, is outlined here. Um, what are antibiotics, what's resistance, and how does that intersect with COVID? So first, what are antibiotics? So it's kind of interesting to think about how we dealt with infections in the pre-antibiotic era. Um, you know, we were uh, in a state where we didn't understand how to deal with, uh, with infectious organisms. We didn't have vaccines. We didn't have uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, this is kind of similar to what you are, we're, we're all feeling now because we were, you know, wearing masks and had our own PPE and of course physical distancing is as appropriate. So things have not changed uh, in the way, honestly, that we deal with infectious organisms for which we have no ways of controlling their impacts like through vaccines and therapeutics. All of this changed in the early 20th century with this collection of, of individuals. Uh, on the left is um, Alexander Fleming, who discovered by accident the activity of penicillin, which is the molecule at the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, slide. Um, Fleming, as a microbiologist, recognized the activity, but he couldn't turn it into a drug. He couldn't purify it. He couldn't, he couldn't actually get through it. Instead, what, he, what, ha what had to happen is we had to have a, have a decade or so later, the intervention of others with, with parallel, or, or sorry, with complementary skill sets. So Ernst Chain is a chemist who helped purify the molecule and characterize its activity. Um, Flory was a pathologist, so someone who sees patients and was able to take the penicillin that was discovered by um, Fleming and purified by Chain and actually test it on patients. And Dorothy Hodgkin was a biophysicist who determined the three-dimensional structure of penicillin, which actually enabled all of the current penicillin drugs that we have today. So you have a microbiologist, a chemist, and a, uh, a, a clinician and a biophysicist that are essential for making this compound such a life-changing um, and actually uh, society changing uh, ad, ad advance. And I'm gonna come back to this idea of teams and multidisciplinarity at the end of the talk about how important that is to address these problems. That discovery in the mid 1940s was quickly followed up by the discovery of a lot of the other mycins and, and so that we're well familiar with, whether it's streptomycin, the first compound that was used to treat, to treat tuberculosis, tetracycline, one of the first oral drugs available that could treat gram-negative infections, the cephalosporins, which launched another uh, 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 part of the family tree of penicillin-like compounds, rifampin, which is used uh, uh, every day to treat tuberculosis in the world today. So all of this happened within an actually very short period of time. Um, but it had an amazing impact. Right? So antibiotics have really changed the way that we die. So if you think about it, what it was like a, uh, 100 years ago, these are Statistics Canada data. Um, most of the, or the majority of, of causes of death, tuberculosis, um, uh, influenza, gastritis, et cetera, was, was due to infections, so 56%. The average life expectancy of Canadians at that point was 59 years. Fast forward to uh, 2018, which is the latest uh, available Statistics Canada data. What are we dying of now? Well, we're dying of diseases of, of basically 
old age, wear and tear, uh, diabetes, Alzheimer's, chronic diseases, cancer and, and cardiovascular disease, and infectious disease really only can, um, accounts for 3%. Even with the COVID crisis that we're facing now, that's not gonna change very significantly. The life expectancy now is, is north of 80 years. So we've gained over 20 years of life with, by controlling infections um, with antibiotics and of course, with things like vaccines as well. So it's really has changed the way that we die. Not only that, antibiotics are, are essential to modern medicine. And the reason why we're dying of different things now is because now we can do major surgeries without concern of infection. We can replace our knees and hips as we get older and, and, and want to um, have better mobility. Um, we can treat cancer in a way that wipes out our immune system and then which would normally put us at tremendous risk of infection. But with antibiotics, we can fight that off. We can actually exchange organs in, in a way that, uh, that you would never even dream of before, before by suppressing the immune system and then dealing with infections with antibiotics. And of course, um, the other element in all of this is, is that many of the, the deaths that occurred 100 years ago occurred in infants um, before the year, the, the, they were the, at the, the age of five or so. Uh, and so uh, preterm infants were, even, were not even uh, thought of before. So we can do all of this stuff now. So without antibiotics, we lose it all, right? And you can see us slipping backwards towards the life expectancy. So the history of antibiotics, I, I like to show in this way. So it's, we have discovery on the left and we're all very happy, but over time resistance starts to emerge. And then that's okay, because we just repeat it. We discover a new antibiotic, like I showed you. Um, but now we're in this, the cycle is broken. We're no longer discovering new antibiotics so that the, the little uh, cartoon guy on, is, is sad on both sides. There's no new discovery and resistance continues apace. It's, it's sobering to look at this timeline to give you an idea of, of where the current drugs that we're using today come from. So this on the left-hand side, you see here is the early part of the 20th century, the discovery of penicillin as I described before, uh, was in 1928. It didn't actually become a drug until the mid 1940s during the Second World War. But that, as I noted, triggered this, what we now call the golden age of antibiotic discovery. All of these drugs were discovered in the 20 years after that, a little bit in the 1970s, sorry, and practically nothing since the mid 1980s. So why, why does this happen? Why, what, how did we get here? This is all this guy's fault, right? This is all about bacterial evolution. Um, when faced with the challenge of, of uh, a threat like an antibiotic, because bacteria can, can divide so quickly and because frankly, there are so many of them, there are 10 to the 30 bacteria on the planet today, 10 to the 30 bacterial genomes today, 10 to the, there's, only 10 to the 21 stars in the universe. There's only been 10 to the 17 seconds since the Big Bang. So 10 to the 30 is a huge number. And that's, the, that's just what's available today in terms of bacterial genomics. So evolution is a big problem, but also bacteria are notoriously promiscuous. They are um, quite happy exchanging their genetic um, information amongst each other. Um, even among bacteria of, of vastly different species and genera. So you end up selecting for resistance in one organism and it can rapidly disseminate through populations of bacteria um, that are completely different to it. And so this is how we see resistance genes, for example, um, that originate in an enteric organism like E. coli, eventually making it into some um, more challenging uh, infectious organism like Pseudomonas. This is because of this constant exchange that occurs through natural selection. So the bacteria and evolution are a big part of this problem, but we are a big part of this problem as well. So the world is interconnected now in a way that has never been before in the history of the planet, even during a pandemic. So we can move people and goods around the planet with ease without any uh, barriers uh, any longer. We um, farm uh, food animals 
whether it's through aquaculture or through traditional uh, agriculture, on a scale that the planet again has never seen before. And many times that requires um, the use of antibiotics. We are in a process of, because there's so many people on the planet, we are in a process of devastating our ecosystems. We are encroaching in areas that we never did before. We're facing the outcome of that now with the, this uh, coronavirus that likely came from a wild bat. Uh, but we have a, an ecological crisis on the planet that is again, been unprecedented. And of course that's resulting in, in human migration again on a, on a very uh, large scale. So all of this contributes to moving bacteria around the planet to creating selective opportunities for uh, antibiotic resistance to move amongst organisms and across the globe, right? I'll show you that in a second. So the other reason why this is happening as well is because there's, there's, there's no business case any longer to be made to sell antibiotics or to develop them. So the, um, the funders, the traditional pharma, pharmaceutical companies are fleeing this area. So this is, uh, this is data that I took about uh, six months ago, but it's, it's still exactly the, the same. Um, so the largest public antibiotic uh, research and development companies, their average stock price was down somewhere between uh, 35 and 90% um, between uh, May and November of 2018. If you compare it to what it was, you know, to, to the, the NASDAQ, it was down about one or 2% over that same period of time. So these companies here that I'm showing you, this is their stock prices and you can see them going down. So pay attention to these three. So Cajun in the left-hand uh, corner brought a new antibiotic to, to market um, in uh, the late 19, um, uh, or in the late 20, in the late 2018, as did Tetraphase and Melinta, they all had FDA approval. So this is exactly what their fund, their, what the funders wanted them to do. They wanted to invest in a, in a new drug and have it, have it um, approved by the FDA and, and get it into patients. And they either went bankrupt as a result or they were gobbled up by other uh, companies in the case of Tetraphase and that compound is, has been shelved. So we have drugs, but we can't make any money on them. And so as a result, um, the, uh, the companies and, the, and the, who we've come to, to trust and to rely on to bring new drugs to market are no longer doing so. It's the anti-Adam Smith uh, model. So what's the impact? So I was involved with a, uh, with a group that was charged by the uh, Canadian Council of Academies. Uh, we wrote a report and did a uh, a series of studies um, to ask where are where's Canada now? We and we released that report last fall. So today, 26% of infections in Canada are drug resistant, using a very conservative model of, of an increase of about 40% uh, 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 over time of, of resistance. Um, we expect that uh, to, as I said, increase over 40%. In 2018, 54 Canadians died because their antibiotics didn't work. They used to work. So they didn't die because it was a brand new disease that no one knew how to deal with, which is what we're dealing with now. These people died because we, the drugs that we have that should have worked did not work, right? And we're uh, projecting that to be uh, north of, uh, of 10,000 uh, in a few short years. I like to make this, the, this point right, that I think of antibiotics like seatbelts sometimes. We, we, we expect seatbelts to work. When we go to, or we expect our cars, that our seatbelts in our cars to work. Um, if we had a situation where 5,400 Canadians died a year because some of our seatbelts don't work, I think we'd be up in arms. We'd be telling the, the, the auto manufacturers that they had to fix this. We could not put our, our populace at, in peril because this is completely fixable. And yet it's being completely ignored, right? It's, you know, it's, it's fair to say that we're in a, in a worse situation with COVID, of course, because well over 10,000 Canadians as of today um, have died because of it. But this is a different story because it didn't, we don't, it didn't exist. We didn't have a method of controlling coronaviruses before. 
we had a method of controlling bacterial infections, and now we're slipping. It doesn't just have an impact of, on health, of course. It has a massive impact on the economy. So right now, it costs our, just our healthcare sector, which we all know is so strapped. Just the lack of, of use of it or effectiveness of antibiotics about at, at one and a half billion dollars a year. And that's going to rise over time to about seven and a half, is to, according to our models. That has an impact of about $2 billion on our GDP, and that's going to rise tenfold uh, over time. So when all that stuff happens, as, as drug resistance starts to, to become an issue in, this, in society, what happens? Our quality of life goes down, our, our trust in the clinicians and our trust in the medical system goes down. The, uh, of course, the impacts on things like travel become an issue. Who wants to go someplace that's, that's where they can't control infections? We're living that now. What else what increases, though, is things like isolation, inequality, and, and, and discrimination. And again, we're seeing the parallels today when we can't control infections. So those are, so what's resistance? So let's talk a little bit about that for the next part of the talk. So antibiotics work. There's, they're molecules, most of the time produced by other microbes. So that's why we've been so successful. The microbes on the planet have been at war with each other for the last 4 billion years. And so they've produced all these amazing things. That was Fleming's original observation the, that the fungus uh, on his Petri dish was killing all the bacteria. Um, and those are molecules that go in and target specific bacterial physiology, whether it's the, the membrane around the cell or the, its ability to synthesize proteins or synthesize DNA or, or its cell wall, which is the crust around it that keeps it from, that protects it from, um, uh, from the environment. So that's how they work. So resistance though is much more pleiotropic, many different mechanisms. So the bacteria can synthesize enzymes, so catalytic proteins that can actually chew up uh, antibiotics. They can modify them with other groups so that, the, so that they become um, uh, ineffective against the organism. You can just simply mutate the target that's relatively easy to do when you're dividing every 20 minutes. Um, and the other thing that bacteria have, which is really quite remarkable, is a collection of pumps that have evolved again over billions of years to protect them against these kinds of molecules. And so multiple different ways that you can become resistant. And you can imagine any one of these being mobilized and moving around uh, in bacterial populations. So as I pointed out, um, this resistance spreads around the world. And that's why antibiotic resistance is also a pandemic. It was, we were talking about this in pandemic terms well before the current one that we're living in. It's just slow moving. It's very similar in, in a sense to climate change. It's happening everywhere, but it's slowly happening so that it's not perceptible very often to folks who aren't actually living this experience. So this is just an example. So this is, um, sorry. Resistance uh, in E. coli to fluoroquinolone antibiotics like ciprofloxacin. A lot of companies don't, or countries, sorry, don't report, but you can imagine the darker the color, the more resistance there is. Um, and whether that's it's uh, quinolones or cephalosporins, as you can see here, or car these, the carbapenems, which are sort of last uh, resort antibiotics in many cases, uh, vancomycin, which is a drug that, uh, that I've been working on for 30 years. Um, or, um, or penicillins, it's a global problem, spreads everywhere, and no part of the globe is untouched by this. So we were very curious because there's so much resistance. Where did all this resistance come from in the first place? And so we did a little project in my lab. This is Vanessa DeCosta, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa, and Kate McGran, who is now a corporate lawyer in, on Bay Street, and they got together. Uh, Kate was an undergrad and Vanessa was a PhD student, went out and collected just bacteria that live in the environment, including some here at the RBG. And this is what they look like. These are organisms that, that, that uh, you can find just in soil. And then they asked, are they resistant to any antibiotics? Just out of curiosity. And what we were surprised to see is that they were all multi-drug resistant. On average, we, we sampled 20 antibiotics in this, in this study. On average, these bacteria, which do not cause disease, were already resistant to between seven and eight different antibiotics on average. 
really quite remarkable levels of resistance in the environment. We asked, is this something that's, that's the result of, of antibiotic exposure in, in areas like, uh, like Hamilton, for example? So we went to uh, with a collaborator who's a cave microbiologist. She has access, this is Hazel Barton at the University of Akron. She has access to a cave called the Lechaguilla Cave in New Mexico, which has been sealed from the surface for 3 million years. So there's no bats, there's no um, blind fish, there's no organisms of any kind other than bacteria that live on the surface of the uh, caves in biofilms. And we collected some of those bacteria, brought them back to the lab and tested them against a, a panel of antibiotics. And just like the bacteria that we see in the soil, they're all multi-drug resistant. So they've been isolated, these are current bacteria, but they've been isolated from us, from human activity, um, and from the surface of the planet for millions of years. So there's something intrinsically wired into bacteria to become that they're resistant. So that would suggest that they're quite old, uh, that resistance and, and antibiotics are quite old. And so how do we prove this? Well, we would really like to get ancient organisms, but that's really hard to do because they don't, they're not easily um, collected. But ancient DNA is not so bad. And at McMaster, we have this guy. This is Dr. Hendrik Poinar, uh, who is the Indiana Jones of McMaster University. Uh, and he has made uh, his career in optimizing the techniques to isolate DNA that has, that has been degraded over time for thousands and hundreds of years. And so with, uh, with Hendrik, we connected with uh, colleagues in the um, uh, at the University of Alberta and with the Yukon government, and we sampled permafrost in the Yukon. So the permafrost is, of course, permanently frozen sediment um, that is, is, has been isolated for over time. And so it's, you, you uh, drill it out of uh, these areas with hard rock mining tools, and we brought some of these back to, to McMaster, where we have, uh, where, where Hendrik runs the ancient DNA lab, and um, he was able to, uh, with uh, folks from my lab, isolate um, G DNA from these samples. And the sample I'm going to tell you about is 30,000 years old. So in that uh, sample of DNA, we found DNA for mammoths and extinct bison and extinct small little horses that used to live in northern Canada. And we also found um, antibiotic resistance genes to penicillins, tetracyclines, and to vancomycin, this, uh, this drug that we've been working on for about 30 plus years. So resistance is part of the fabric of micro, microbes over time. And so when we use them inappropriately, we select for the mobilization of these genes out of the environment into clinical pathogens. So that's where resistance comes from. What's the impact uh, with COVID? Well, it's potentially pretty significant. Um, one of the issues is with respiratory tract infections like COVID is that we tend to use a lot of antibiotics because secondary infections are things that we're quite worried about. The other thing that we've seen, uh, not so much now, thank goodness, but at the early part of the pandemic was really the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then, of course, what we're doing is, is every day we're using large amounts of antiseptics. So the secondary infection. So when you are hospitalized with COVID, if you, if you are so sick that you have to go to a hospital, um, there's, in most cases, those patients will get uh, an antibiotic. We're getting better at, at, uh, at triaging these patients to make sure the, that we're not inappropriately prescribing, but at the beginning of the pandemic, all of these patients got large concentrations of antibiotics because we were, we were worried that these secondary infections would become an issue. And these secondary infections are caused by bacteria. In fact, there's a lot of discussion that the major cause of death in the um, 1918 influenza pandemic was not so much the influenza virus, but the secondary infections that caused pneumonia that were untreatable at the time. You can imagine then if you're using a lot of antibiotics in case you're worried that, that you're going to get a bacterial uh, pneumonia infection, then antibiotic resistance will just flow. And of course, these patients are the sickest ones. They're in our ICUs. 
I'm sad to say that the, the worst place for drug resistance is, um, is in our ICUs because we use so many antibiotics and these patients are so uh, often immune compromised that a lot of these really nasty superbugs that are resistant to many, if not all antibiotics are, can be found there. So if you're there and you're sick from COVID, it's, it's, uh, it's a risk that, uh, that is unfortunate we have to manage. The other thing that happened in particular, as I said at the beginning, you'll remember there was a lot of discussion about hydroxychloroquine and the uh, individual uh, who uh, proposed this idea also coupled it with azithromycin. And azithromycin is an antibiotic that is very commonly given for upper respiratory tract infections of bacteria. Azithromycin has absolutely no effect on viruses. Uh, and yet that was part of the magic sauce that this person put together. And, and of course, um, it created just an avalanche of clinical trials um, of, to see whether or not this, this actually worked. Of course, we all know now that it doesn't, but at the time that actually caused a shortage of azithromycin. Um, so that we ended up in a, in a situation where for patients who did need this drug, we couldn't get it because we were so desperate to try and find a solution for COVID at the time. Goes to show you how important it is to be, to be prepared with antiviral agents, right? Because you have this, this you know, not having an antiviral agent for uh, an upper respiratory tract infection like COVID means that you're using antibiotics more uh, and that's a, uh, a dangerous uh, outcome. And the other thing, of course, is that we saw in particular at the beginning of it, we've, we've all seen these images of uh, not so much in, in Canada, but in other parts of the world where they're fogging areas uh, with these antiseptics. Now, this is not the, the hand sanitizers that we're used to. These hand sanitizers that we use that are in front of the grocery store or um, that you use uh, you know, in your pocket, I have one now, those are based on alcohol. And those alcohol-based ones do not select for drug resistance, but the, the kind that used antiseptics um, do. And that widespread use of these, especially in, in wide open places, like we saw in town squares and in uh, uh, stadiums around the world, uh, we don't yet know if that's had a, a major impact, but it certainly has the potential to be, uh, to cause uh, selective pressure for AMR. And the reason for that is that these drug resistance genes are found on these mobile elements, these plasmids, these, I showed you, you know, the bacteria exchange genetic information, but they exchange them in packages that can claim, contain drug resistance genes and resistance genes to antiseptics. So if you're using a lot of antiseptics, you can pull those resistance genes into these organisms just by hitchhiking, not because you're selecting for it directly. But it may not be so bad. One of the things that we've realized, of course, is that, is that we're not shaking hands with each other and exchanging a lot of things. The cold and flu season south of, uh, of the border in, in uh, the Southern Hemisphere has been much less than previous, um, that we've experienced in previous uh, years. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're not meeting together. You know, we're social animals, so there's a, there's a price to that, to our psyche, but um, the other advantage is that we're not interacting with each other and we're not catching these, these uh, infections from each other. So we're not exchanging um, microbes with each other. There's been a lot less uh, air travel and commuter travel. So there's not a lot of, you know, the subway is not as packed so much. Uh, I haven't been on an airplane since February. Um, so, and I used to travel probably once every two weeks. Uh, and inevitably, you know, once every couple of months, I had some nasty head cold or something that I'm confident I picked up somewhere uh, during my travels. Um, and of course, the other thing is, is that, um, is that hospitals are no longer crowded with visitors or anything like that. They're, you know, patients can go, but we're really trying to limit the amount of people, the amount of exposure that happens. So when that happens, the threat of infection decreases, and then maybe the overall antibiotic use will de decrease as well. We still don't know because we're so early into it. So there's a tremendous risk for the COVID of having a very negative impact on antibiotic 
um, an antibiotic, antibiotic use and therefore antibiotic resistance. But there's a potential that it might not be so bad. Nevertheless, we still haven't solved that critical problem in that we don't have any new drugs. No one is bringing these drugs to market, folks. This is a problem, right, that exists. So whether or not COVID is going to result in a tipping point, um, you know, and push AMR even further down the road, or if it's going to have be a slight delaying tactic, at the end of the day, we have to have a, come up with a way to solve this problem. So I'll just show you this slide again, because just like the impact of AMR, we're feeling this now with, with COVID-19. What's the effect? Levels of trust are down. Of course, who do you, who do you trust? We have all these mixed messages. Quality of, or quality of life has certainly gone down. No one's traveling. Uh, the, the amount of social interactions have decreased dramatically. Isolation has increased. The, the amount of inequity that the virus has exposed in our populations is just simply tragic. Uh, that results from um, stick, uh, things like discrimination, and of course, and those old things, all those go with the stigmatization of, of individuals, as we see as 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 others. So, so the whole COVID and AMR are parallel pandemics, syndemics, we call them. Um, they're intersecting in ways that we don't understand exactly um, what the outcomes will be, except that the impacts are going to be felt for decades um, and, and perhaps generations. So let me end with uh, something more positive, maybe. <laughs> and, and we've been thinking very hard about this. Um, at McMaster for a number of years. And in fact, when we started the Infectious Disease uh, Research Institute with the, with the support of Mr. DeGroot, we consciously um, made a point of making sure that we brought people in to the Institute from across various disciplines. It wasn't just microbiologists and it wasn't just clinicians and it wasn't just biochemists. It was mathematicians who can do modeling. It was, it was, um, uh, clinical trial specialists. It was folks like Hendrik Poinar who have really brought interest into the area of anthropology. We thought that by trying, by trying to uh, bring these people in who normally wouldn't interact with, with each other on a daily basis, that we could move the needle on this. And we have. We've been incredibly successful in the Institute. But this experience has shown us that that's not enough. What we really need to add to a group, to a multidisciplinary group like um, we have at the, at the Institute, are social scientists who can tell us about how do we, how do we interact with our, our peers, um, historians who have understood and studied pandemics and how populations and, and people react to them and what, we, what the learnings are for that. Um, business folks who can understand how do we make sure that supply chain management is, is dealt with, engineers who can uh, help build diagnostics and surfaces to, to help us, new mask technology. So what we really need to do is have a, a site where all of these things can, can come together. And I think the university, the academy, is the place for this to happen, right? We have this collection of experts in all of these areas who, have co who can contribute. And one of the things that I've been so proud of um, at McMaster, but also with my academic colleagues around the world, is how we've been able to pivot so quickly and focus our attention on, on trying to solve the challenges with this virus. At McMaster, we, our engineering group moved from looking at different kinds of surfaces to try and develop new mask technologies and new ways to test these masks so that, so that the private sector could bring them to, um, to market as quickly as possible. In our uh, institute, we opened our doors to, uh, for our biosafety level three lab, uh, which is one of the very few in the, in the region, to be able to study the virus for, for companies, for example, who, th who had uh, innovations that they thought could actually have, have an impact. This integration of, of our infrastructure, our expertise, and our network of potential collaborators and partners around the region and around uh, the country and indeed around the world is something I think we have the opportunity to capture going forward. And also the young people who are doing all of this work have had just tremendous impact. Like 
people in my lab, for example, we moved overnight from studying antibiotics work on bacteria to antivirals that work on this virus. And the students who were working on this and the postdocs did it literally overnight, right? So they just rolled up their sleeves and they got to work and they, they want to contribute to this. I think the university going forward, not just ours, but universities in general, have an opportunity to be a catalyst that, that, is, that is unencumbered by the bureaucracy that, for example, governments have to deal with or the specific attention to shareholders that the private sector does. So we came up with this idea at the university that we're building on, and I wanna, I wanna uh, introduce it to you, and then we're gonna talk a lot more about it over the next few months. We're calling it the Global Nexus for Pandemics and Biological Threats. We wanna do exactly that. We wanna be able to bring multidisciplinary teams to the current pandemic, but also emerging ones and outbreaks and other epidemics that, that might occur. We've got this core expertise in infection and, um, and immunity at McMaster. Can we now bring in all those folks that I told you about? How do we deal with the socioeconomic impacts of these things? How do we deal with equity issues? How, what's all the, how do we deal with trust, right? We're gonna probably have four or five different vaccine candidates over the next year. How do we, how does the public trust which one to take? What's the information that we need to be able to provide them? How do, and that's not something that a microbiologist in the lab can figure out. This is something where people well-trained in communication, well-trained in the so, in sociology can really have an impact. And there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for our colleagues across, the, across campus to contribute in a, in a really meaningful way. We're hoping to be able to put all this together in a brand new site where we can actually, we have architects working about how, on thinking about how do we build something that is enhances opportunities for collaboration, enhances opportunities for mathematicians to bump into historians, uh, to bump into molecular biologists. What's the dynamic and how do we, how do we make that happen in a physical place? But before that, we, we have this, we can start launching this program and we are. Um, it has as its, as its core, this group of experts in health systems and in microbiology and in engineering and in math and in business to be able to solve these big problems so that we're providing the evidence and the information that policymakers and the public need and the, um, the products that we need and the pilot and to pilot these in, in meaningful ways so that the private sector and governments and the not-for-profits can now take these and take them to the next level and make sure that they get distributed to the right people so that we can be ready for the next pandemics so that we can respond to the current one and, and the ones that are going to happen and that in the face of it while we're waiting for these responses to work that we can be that our, our economies and our societies and our communities are resilient in the face of it. So that's our ambition. It's super grand, but I think it's super positive. If the one thing that could come out of all this bad news that I just told you about over the last half an hour or so is that I think we're ready to make this change. Uh, and I do think that, that um, the team at McMaster can really, uh, can really lead the way. So I'll just finish there. Just remind you that we are in a pandemic. AMR is a pandemic or drug resistance. Um, it's, it's an existential threat to the way we practice medicine. Um, and it's the result of all sorts of things. It's the result of evolution, it's the result of bacterial populations, it's the result of human activities. We don't know what the impact of COVID is on AMR, but we will find out and, um, and it has the potential to make it much worse, but maybe we're gonna learn some stuff from this, I think. And I think that's the positive outcome is that we will learn. Whether or not we act on those learnings, is anybody's is anybody's guess, but we're hoping that the Nexus uh, project might be a way forward. So I'll finish there. I'll take any questions that might come up, and um, again, just thank you for the opportunity to tell our story. Are deaths from antibiotic resistance the same as deaths from sepsis? Ah, uh, it's a Good question. Um, they can be, if the organism that so so sepsis is 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 an infection. It could be bacterial, or it could be viral, or it could be even fungal, um, where the immune system has completely outruns 
um, its capacity to control the or just the organism and then actually causes a massive inflammatory response across the entire body. And that is out of, that's your immune system has completely run out of control. Um, if, but that can be caused by drug resistant or non-drug resistant organism. Obviously the outcome is, is if you have an infection, you cannot treat it because you don't have a, you don't have an, uh, an antibiotic for it, then you're at more at risk of sepsis, right? But it's not a direct, uh, the, the cause and effect is not, is not direct. Next question. Resistance to infectious diseases also depends on our body's natural resistance capacities. Are changes in lifestyles, such as changing diets, reducing natural resistance, and making us more reliant on antibiotics that are now becoming less effective? Yeah, I mean, this, the short answer to that is I don't think so. I think obviously a healthy lifestyle is great no matter what, because it provides you, it, 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 all those things, those, those conditions that might result of that, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, um, those are all bad for you and can lead to infections. And as a result, if you're healthier, you're gonna you're have um, less of a chance of getting an infection than you will if you're if you have these underlying conditions. So the advice is great, you know, do all the things that you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, the participation told us to do back in the 70s. Uh, you know, stay healthy and eat well and do all those things. Um, but it's not so much a direct response to the to our immune system as opposed to you know. A healthy lifestyle means you're gonna not gonna have all these other underlying impacts, or have a less chance of of doing that, and as a result, you're gonna have fewer chances of infection. Next question: Can you repeat what you learned from the permafrost DNA study and antibiotic resistance? Yeah, okay, I, I moved through that pretty fast. So, so think of the permafrost as frozen mud. And that frozen mud uh, from 30,000 years ago contains all of the, of the remnants of the organisms that were around that mud. Um, and uh, while we can't isolate those bacteria easily from that long ago, they tend to, their membranes and everything tend to get uh, impacted by ice crystals. The DNA is remarkably stable. And so it's, very easy to isolate DNA from, well, easy. Using the techniques that, we've, that folks like Hendrik Poynter have developed, it's easy to isolate the, that very ancient DNA. And then you have a pile of ancient DNA that you can amplify using techniques like PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, which of course is the basis for all the COVID tests that everyone, everyone is taking. So that polymerase chain reaction, we can design it so that it will amplify um, DNA that we know that is associated with things like mammoths and bison and that and, and plants and animals. And we specifically designed um, probes for drug resistance genes. Um, and that's how we found those drug resistance genes. We could pull them out, sequence them. And in fact, in one case, we were actually able to reconstruct an entire protein, purify that protein in the lab. So we re reconstructed the DNA, stitched it all together, put that in an, or, uh, an E. coli in the lab today and then grew it up and actually showed that it does what it, it still has a drug resistant um, activity that it had in the past. And we even solved the three-dimensional structure to show that it looks just like the genes that we have today that are circulating in our hospitals. So these genes have been around for a long time. I hope, that I hope that's a better explanation. Next question. Is there truth to the fact that the Spanish flu is really still with us, but in a mutated, more mild form? And do you foresee the same thing with COVID in that it will become endemic in the population and we will learn to live with it? Well, the, the influenza virus from uh, that caused the, I don't like to use Spanish flu. <laughs> Uh, the only reason why it's called that is because they were the only uh, newspapers that weren't censored at the time. And so um, it actually started in the United States. 
But anyways, um, the 1918 flu is called that. Um, certainly, so influenza viruses are slightly different in that they're mosaic viruses that, that originate in uh, swine and fowl and then circulate around the world. Um, so there are various elements that are similar to that virus that continue to uh, circulate within influenza viruses that are uh, within s uh, swine and, and, and waterfowl. Um, so in some ways, the answer to that question is yes, but not in the way that you would think that it's, you know, we all got it and now it's just everywhere. It's not how that works. The corona, this coronavirus is, is likely going to be with us for a long time. It's, and the reason for it is, is uh, well, we don't know, first of all, we don't know Here's what we don't, we don't know enough about whether or not the immunity we get is lasting. So if it's, if it's not lasting, and we've seen a few cases of reinfection, uh, they're not common, but they've already seen it. So that's, I don't, um, then it could very well be that we're, if we're not getting really good antibody titers, then it will circulate, you know, contemporaneously within populations for a long time. Um, the thing to get rid, the, the way that we're gonna get rid of this virus is, is through a massive vaccination program. We cannot achieve herd immunity by letting it rip through 6 billion people across the planet. I mean, we could, but we're gonna kill, you know, so many people and we're also going to destroy the entire global economy for decades. So that is just, I know that there are people out there who are, who are propo proposing this. There's some very, uh, very smart people who think that this is the case, but they are absolutely wrong. This is not how you do this. The way that we're gonna get herd immunity is through a vaccine. And once we could do that, if we can get the, you know, depending on the models that we use, you know, if we can get 60% of the population, 70% of the population vaccinated with a good antibody titer, then this virus could eventually disappear. I mean, we've done this in the past with other vaccines. We've done it with, polio to almost a large extent, we've eradicated smallpox. Measles was completely under control until again, you know, Facebook and the internet took over. Um, so we really have to, it gets, it gets back to this idea, this concept of the nexus where we have to bring in people who can help scientists like me get them understand you know, the challenges of getting this kind of information out to other people. So in the absence of a really robust vaccine, and I'm confident that we're going to get one. Um, letting it rip through the population is a really, really bad idea. Next question. Um, what is the current efficacy of an old antibiotic like penicillin? Will it still be in use in the next couple of decades? Huh, that's a really good question. I love that question. <laughs> um, so for, for some infections, well, let me give you a good, a good example. Strep throat, the streptococcus pyogenes that causes strep throat remains after all of these years completely susceptible to that old penicillin. Uh, we don't really understand why. Uh, I have some ideas about what it might be. They're all kind of involved in cell wall biosynthesis, but so it's still gonna work. Um, it depends on where you're at. If you're in the community, what you in getting infected by bugs that are circulating within people, you know, some of these old antibiotics like azithromycin, some of the older penicillins are still quite effective because again, you have to select for these genes to stay in, in these bacteria. And so what does that mean? That means you have to use antibiotics in order to maintain resistance. When you take antibiotics away, eventually resistance, because um, they're on these little mobile elements, it's, it's not good for them to carry all this genetic information around. So the pop in a, over a population, not necessarily an individual, but over a population, the effectiveness is still not so bad. It's one of the reasons why everyone, you know, you can't charge $40,000 for an antibiotic treatment or for a brand new antibiotic treatment because all the other ones are 10 bucks, right? And so, there's always gonna be some efficacy for some of these old drugs. It's, it's just that when, 
So in the hospital, for example, where we use lots of antibiotics are in farms where they're gonna use lots of antibiotics. The number of drug resistant organisms just goes up pretty, very high. So it wouldn't be useful in, uh, in a hospital. So, and you wouldn't wanna, you know, if you or if, if, or your grandchildren were in the ICU, you wouldn't wanna rely on the drugs that were discovered in the 1950s, but, um, but out in the community, there's still a good potential to use them. Why is there no longer money to be made from discovering new, new antibiotics? Well, you know, the volume isn't there. The reason why, so azithromycin is a good example. Azithromycin used to be, I have to check again. So it used to be called Zithromax. Um, when it was on patent, it made uh, the company that made it, and I forget which one it is, you know, about a billion dollars a year. And the reason for it is because it was prescribed by community physicians. So you show up, you know, you got a cough thing, you know, they, they listen to your lungs. You go, yeah, you, you got some fluid in your lungs. It's 99% or 90% of the time it's going to be a virus, but you know, it's not going to hurt if I give you this script. And so everyone who was in cold and flu season got a script for Zithromax when they went. So that was in the past. Now, hopefully it's not like this anymore. Um, so then the volume sales thing makes a lot of sense, right? If every community physician in, in, um, in the fall and winter is prescribing, you know, drugs for people who have the sniffles, then um, you're going to make a lot of money. But now if all of a sudden we realize that that's not a good idea, you're not going to make a lot of money. So it's, it's the volume sale model again. Next question. <clears throat> Do you think that phage therapy will prove to be a real major breakthrough with antibiotic resistance bacteria? Oh, that's a lovely question. So for, for people who don't know what phage are, phage are viruses that infect bacteria. So the only, um, the only, um, genetic element that's more abundant on the planet than bacteria, just 10 to the 30 bacteria, as I mentioned, there's 10 to the 31 phage on the planet. So there's lots of phage. So they're viruses that infect bacteria and, and they have been shown in many cases to be very effective antimicrobial agents. Um, the challenge with them is they're so specific. So, the thing, the advantage of most antibiotics is that you, whether you're infected by a salmonella or an E. coli or a Klebsiella, most of the drugs that you would take for any one of those would work on all of them. Phages tend to be, they're like lock and key. You know, they will only attack salmonella, not E. coli, not the other ones. So that you could think of that, that's an advantage. If you know that you have a salmonella infection, that makes good sense. Um, but in most cases, the clinician is faced with a situation where they don't know what that is and they have to react very quickly. So that's a bit of a challenge. We've also, it's also been shown that you can't just use one phage. You have to use cocktails of phages and they have to be purified using, you know, the same kinds of, of, uh, of manufacturing processes for as antibodies, for example. So that's a challenge, but there's, there's going to be a niche for these going forward. It was, they, they were used quite um, to, you know, in the, in the former Soviet Union, um, they were used as a primary uh, therapy for many infections for, for years and years. So there is a way to, to, to use them. Um, there's been anecdotal show, uh, evidence that shows for really serious infections um, that we can do this. Stephanie Strasky, who was, uh, came and gave a talk for the Gardner Symposium here at McMaster last November, has written an entire book on that. It's called The Perfect Predator. If you want something, a, a real page turner where her husband got infected by a multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter baumannii, which is a nasty, nasty, nasty bug, which, and, and it was resistant to every drug we had. She was able to collate together labs across the United States from, from the Navy and stuff with viruses that would eventually cure that infection. So there are gonna be isolate or niche kind of uses for it, but I don't see it um, ever being so widespread that we would be able to use it as a general therapy. Next question. Today, if a patient has an antibiotic resistant infection, what is the course of treatment available to physicians? Well, there's very, if 
you know, if there is, if it's resistant to everything that we have, then the course is just to do exactly what we did before antibiotics were around, which was, you know, uh, keep the patient as comfortable as possible uh, and hope for the best. I mean, there are therapies such as gamma globulin therapies um, that can be used, which is sort of pooling of of antibodies that were uh, collected from uh, blood donors from uh, uh, that could hopefully bring uh, that down. There's the use of anti-inflammatory agents to basically calm down inflammation, uh, which often is associated with it. Um, in cases where it can be done, I mean, surgery is another another option. So you can, for you know, we've seen this, for example, in. Uh, uh, you know, for people who have uh, diabetes where their extremities get infected a lot of times, antibiotics are really, really challenging because of they can't even get to the, you know, to, to those regions because of the complexity in the vasculature. So the, you know, removing, you know, parts of or entire limbs can, can happen. So this is basically what we used to do back in, you know, the 30s and 20s and, and stuff. Um, so there are... Um, with, with a few, obviously, of some modern improvements in, 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 in convalescence, but um, there's not a lot of options. Next question. What are the most important things you can do to boost your immune system? Two part. And when do you think a vaccine will be ready for COVID-19? Yeah, so the first part, as I said, I think I, I said at the outset, um, boosting the immune system is, for those of us in the, in, in the, in the business, it doesn't, it's not a thing. It's something that it's, it's very, it's, it's very catchy and you see it everywhere and, and, you know, natural health places try and sell you food supplements and things like that. Your immune system is, is just fine. If you're a healthy individual and you don't have any underlying, um, uh, you know, genetic diseases that are preventing your immune system from working properly, um, your immune system should be just fine. Uh, all this, this stuff is just, you know, there, I have never seen a clinical trial that showed that some of these so-called immune boosting agents work. So if there was one and then, then I'd be happy to believe in it, but right now I haven't seen any, um, my immunologist friends might, might know of something, but I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I think most of this is snake oil. So the stuff that I said at the beginning, you know, healthy lifestyle is always, you know, keep yourself from having all these underlying, um, uh, issues like diabetes and heart disease and and, um, and obesity. If you can manage that, then generally you should be fine. Um, if you have any specific issues other than that, then I think that's when you need to consult. I'm not, first of all, let me first of all say, I am not a clinician. <laughs> I'm a PhD uh, who runs an infectious disease institute. I'm, so this is not free medical advice. This is my opinion. Um, the second question, when are we going to get a vaccine? We're going to get a vaccine in 2021. Uh, we're probably going to get more than one vaccine. Um, this is why we're at a really crucial stage right now. Like people have to realize just how unbelievably fast this is moving. Like it's just everything from identifying what the causative agent was of COVID-19 to the sequencing of the genome, to the sharing of that information, to the building of the first vaccine platforms, to the studies for finding new drugs has happened so unbelievably fast. I know it's not fast enough. I, I want it to have, I want it to be here now. I'm sick of working out of my home office. Um, but it's gone at absolute lightning speed. But what we cannot do, we have to be absolutely careful. And, and I'm very confident in this particular in Canada that we're going to be on top of this is that we do not give an unsafe product to the population. So we have to be very careful about these clinical trials. There's many, there's, uh, there's well over a dozen um, vaccine candidates out there in late stage clinical trials, all of whom are slightly different than the others. And um, it now we have to wait, sorry, we have to wait and see. I'm hopeful that that waiting and seeing is going to be in months and we're going to be able to pick a few winners. Canada has been very proactive about going ahead and promising to buy from um, many of these different flavors from these companies. So that encourages those companies to keep investing in this, in this area. Um, but even if we, even if tomorrow 
you know, Moderna says our vaccine gives you 80% um, uh, protection, which would be fantastic. Um, it couldn't make enough doses overnight to be able to, to do this. We have to wait for the manufacturing. We also have to wait to have the infrastructure to be able to give that vaccine, you know, Ideally, it's so it's trivial, and it'll be like the flu vaccine. There won't be any issues. You can give it out at shoppers, drug mart, or something. Um, but because this is so new, I would suspect that we're going to be very careful about the way that we we give it out. We don't know what the side effects are going to be on a population of millions and millions. You know, we don't do clinical trials on millions of people. We do clinical trials on thousands of people. So we have to move carefully because what we don't want to do is give out something and then have some percentage of the population get sicker or, or put them in a bad position. So we're going to get something in 2021. I'm going to guess, you know, by June, we should have at least a couple of, of candidates that look really promising that, that will go into manufacturing and we can start giving the, to our, the most vulnerable populations first.